You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. And today, my co-host is Director of Recruitment, Mr. Casey Galpin. Thank you, Casey, for joining me today. No problem, Summer. I'm happy to be here. On today's episode, Casey and I got to talk to pediatric urologist Dr. Steve Hodges. Dr. Hodges is currently practicing in North Carolina. He's super passionate about what he does, and his focus within his specialty is in bedwetting. Um, And who knew it could be such a kind of a controversial topic? So he's going to get into this and explain a lot about the misconceptions and what's actually causing it. Um, I didn't know that there was an actual medical reason and he's done his research and explains it extremely well. So if you have kids in that potty training age, I would definitely listen to this episode. Um, You're going to learn a lot. Um, Also, Dr. Hodges has some really good advice for upcoming residents and fellows. Um, He has a few books out, so we're going to pick his brain um, about the inspiration behind these books and where we can get them. So stay tuned after this quick disclaimer for our chat with Dr. Steve Hodges. And just a quick reminder, this podcast is intended to be an open forum. Any personal beliefs, views, or opinions represented in this episode are that of our guest and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Pacific Companies. So please have an open mind and remember that this podcast is not a news source, but rather a safe and neutral platform for candid conversations. Welcome to the Doc Lounge, Dr. Hodges. So let's start from the beginning. What inspired you to get into medicine? Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about that and um, I don't really recall. You know, I was a uh, like a, a Greek immigrant kid and I was good at science, so it was almost like expected you become a physician, you know. So funny, I don't remember making like a, like a choice that that's really what I wanted to do, but I, I did have a, a neighbor in, in high school that was a heart surgeon. And we had career day. I was able to go uh, in the operating room with him. So I obviously had an interest back then, and I really enjoyed that experience. So kind of started down that road. And I really can't point to what specific event started that. But then, like, way later on, you know, I think it was in med school, we took, a, we took like, our Myers-Briggs personality profile, you know, and I was, like, INTJ, which fits pretty good for a surgeon. So I, I think that... You know, you end up where you're supposed to be. I don't know. I can't really – I have a b- better stories for why I did what I did. But in terms of medicine in general, I think it was kind of by chance. And um, I think that's one of the good things about medicine, is, and I think you guys will agree, is that if you do medicine, you could probably fit – find a job in medicine that you enjoy regardless of your personality or, you know, because there's so much uh, breadth in the field. Absolutely. Dr. Rogers, one of the questions that I love to ask is, when you're in med school, you're going through the rotation stuff. What makes you choose urology and specifically pediatric urology? How do you go about deciding that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, because I, I don't think anyone's ever grown up wanting to be a urologist, you know. Like you don't ask a five-year-old and they say, I want to be a urologist. And most people find urology by accident, and, I, and that was my case. So, again, at my when we selected um, – Surgery, surgery subspecialties, you could pick general surgery, obviously, and you had a couple of uh, subspecialties you could pick as a lottery. And um, in the lottery, I chose, I think I chose ENT because um, I was interested in that in plastics. And then um, urology, I picked urology, honestly, because I had a, a, a good friend of ours from church um, was a urologist, and he's a, now the chairman at uh, U, uh, Alabama University, um, their urology department. He's a very prominent um Endourologist named Dr. Dina Simos, and uh, mm-hmm. I, it's the only really doctor I knew, right, uh, personally. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I would love to rotate through him. And I got I, the, my I got selected high enough in my lottery that I was able to pick what I wanted. So I, I did urology, and and you know the work was really hard. That was a time when I mean the hours were in, insane, and he is a workaholic. So it really hit me hard in terms of work, but I really enjoyed it. Number one, urology tends to select for a certain personality type uh, that fits mine well, and uh, 
if you've met many surgery subspecialists, I think you'll agree that, you know, orthopods are a certain type and um, general surgeons are a certain type and urologists are, are definitely a certain type and they're kind of, kind of little, don't take themselves too seriously because it's, it's a, it's a field where you're doing a lot of uh, weird things, weird exams and uh, weird yeah. surgeries. So, and so, you know, it's kind of a joking kind of group of guys that uh, has a pretty good sense of humor and I, I've seen that throughout the field. So I think that, that fit well. And then when I was working with Dr. Simos, I, you know, I didn't really end up liking stone surgery that much. Um, I still don't. But I, I, I did a rotation with uh, a pediatrologist during that service. His name was Dr. Lawrence Cruvan, and um, really loved pediatrology. So just by random chance, I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what it did. And I don't know if it's a combination of the personalities, the uh, surgeries, the camaraderie, but it just kind of clicked. So I was lucky at that point that I, as a med student that I knew I wanted to do urology and pedrology as a subspecialty. Gotcha. Tell us more about what your focus is on with your uh, pediatric urology. Yeah, so pediatric urology in, in general is a, a surgical, su- surgical subspecialty that deals with the congenital malformations of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and then sometimes the genitalia. So um, mm-hmm. about half the stuff we deal with, kids are born with, and then the other half are, are developmental problems, uh, uh, problem, problems that they have developed. Um, and it usually deals with um, urinary tract infections or incontinence. And um, so that, that's like all of urology. I, I've got, I do a lot of general urology, but I've gotten a, a specific interest in boring dysfunction. And that's a, for various reasons. Number one is, Urologists are um, surgeons by by nature, so we most urologists just use clinic as a means of either setting up or following up surgery, and mm-hmm. so because that's the main thing that we do, and that's how we, you know we make a living. But so if you go to most other urologic programs, there will be um, physician extenders, uh, nurse practitioners, PA. They handle all the children with uh, incontinence, or they call them you know voiding the function clinic. So kids that come in with bedwetting, daytime wetting infections, they won't even usually see the urologist. But by chance, where I was, um, I was working with two other urologists. Uh, one is my, still my chairman, Dr. Tala, who's a world-famous, you know, researcher. He does tissue engineering. He's in the lab a lot, although he's very busy clinically. And the other uh, uh, surgeon was Dr. Gordon McClory, who was a famous reconstructive surgeon. He He was doing these, you know, Big surgeries, we do them together, obviously, but he had much more experience. They're very rare cases that take, you know, all day. And so he was um, uh, seeing most of his patients in follow-up. So uh, by chance, I was seeing most of the patients with incontinence since there, were no, there was no one else to see him. And what happened was that I was doing the routine therapy for this that we've been taught, right? I was doing the, the cookbook therapy that, you know, a PA or a nurse practitioner would do somewhere else. And these kids were not getting better. Early in my career, I was saying, these kids are just, they're not progressing. Um, I'm doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing, and they're not getting better. And it kind of was bugging me, you know, because there's only so many times where you can bring a a kid back to clinic, and they're no better, and and you have nothing else to offer them. So a couple of interesting things happened all at once at that time. One is that uh, I I took a trip to uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital for a course. This course was uh, the Alberto Pena course, which is on um, um, anal rectal malformation surgery. So there are certain conditions of the of the of the anus and the bladder that kind of go together that we fix with general surgeons, such as a perforate anus or, or cloacal anomalies and so forth. And so I went there to learn about that. And at that course, I noticed that. Um, they were doing really aggressive bowel programs for these kids for various reasons. Uh, these kids were born with conditions that necessitated it. But during that program, they were x-raying all these kids every time they would see them um, to see how they were pooping. And then when I got back from that course, I had a surgery for kidney reflux on, a, on an infant, pardon me, a child, that was pooping normally, according to the parents. We were doing all the things that you should do to help this problem resolve, and it didn't resolve. So when I did the surgery, I was shocked to see that the child was really constipated on, you know, when I'm down in, in her belly, um, 
colon was full of poop. And so mm-hmm. I decided at that moment, you know what, I'm going to start doing x-rays because obviously if you ask the parents, and this has been proven time and time again, they were telling me the kid was pooping fine, but the kid wasn't pooping fine. And so I figured I'll do the x-rays like I did in Cincinnati. And that's how this all started. I basically started doing x-rays on these kids that came in with normal bowel habits but urinary problems. All their x-rays were significantly abnormal, like really, really far gone, like so full of poop. You would have thought that, you know, they couldn't even get through the day. Mm -hmm. And I started treating the poop aggressively, and they were getting better really rapidly. And I could talk forever. I want to leave questions. But then that led to the whole next discovery that I can keep talking about if you if you want me to. Yeah, absolutely. Keep going. So when I found out this problem with the colon, I was like, wow, this is, I'm a, you know, I'm a genius. I'm going to win a Nobel Prize. This is totally, this is great. So I'm the first person to ever do this. So I told my resident, pull all these papers, and we're going to write about what's going on here. And so I remember she called me up. She, one day she's like, I hate to burst your bubble, but this has been written about. I don't know how it kind of got misconstrued, but this guy wrote about this in the 80s. His name is Sean O'Regan. He was giving everyone enemas for bedwetting for this very reason. And I was like, holy moly, how do I not know about, you know, how do I not know about this guy? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, remember the movie War Games when, like, uh, Matthew Broderick's looking for uh, Professor Falcon? Yep. Were you too young for that? So that's basically what happened one day. I'm like, I'm going to find this Sean O'Regan guy. And so I spent, like, the whole day looking for Sean O'Regan. He was a pediatric nephrologist in Canada. But he was gone. Wow. He left Canada. So, and all his papers were saying... Idea I could talk forever, but basically he had cured his son of bedwetting, and and figured out that the bedwetting was due to his son's constipation that no one knew he had, and he had diagnosed it, which is a brilliant move if you think about it. So basically his son was wetting the bed, and he was like, "I'm going to fix this. I'm a doctor." Went to the library, looked up every paper on bladder dysfunction, found out that in the 1800s and the 60s of the 1960s there had been a lot of papers relating colon function to bladder dysfunction, and he said, you know what, I'm going to do an anal rectal manometry on my four-year-old son. What that is, is they took a tube with a balloon on it, they put it up his son's bottom at Montreal Children's Hospital, mm-hmm. he, at McGill, he started blowing up the balloon on the tube to see when his son could feel the balloon. His son couldn't feel it until it was three si- three times the normal size. And he's like, well, there you go. My kid's dilated rectum. That's what's causing the bedwetting. I'll give him enemas every day, and he'll get better, which is easy to say, but ridiculously brilliant. Like, how in the world this guy made those connections, I have no idea. Yeah. As a nephrologist, no less. He gave his son an enema every night for a month, and his son was dry, never wet again. And then he did a series of publications about this, tying it to everything from daytime wetting, night wetting, kidney reflux, and caprices. And then he left Canada because the climate of, for medical care was poor, went to America, couldn't get a job in nephrology, and did cardiology. And never oh. wrote on it again. Yeah, he never wrote on it again. And so I tracked him down. I called him at home, and it was like I couldn't believe I found him. I was like, Dr. Regan, this is Steve Hodges. You know, you discovered this. No one understands what constipation means. I, I never forget... He said, yes, because he has an Irish accent, which I can't really do. But he <laughs> said, you know, Steve, you know, it's not constipation. It's incomplete emptying of the rectum. And that's exa- that's it. That's the whole thing. And so I, he's become a good friend. I devoted my, you know, I, I, I devoted, I, I uh, commemorated him in the first book in terms of uh, honored him by people who put the inside cover. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how we basically figured out how you fix bedwetting. And, and I honestly don't know. Well, I do know. I think what happened was he was using enemas. People don't like enemas. Miralax came out, and people just started using Miralax, and it's not as effective. And so his research kind of got lost to history. Wow. So I'm trying to bring it back. Yeah. It's crazy that there is that connection because it seems so simple in a way, you know? Oh, yeah. It's funny because, you know, if I explain it to anybody, like my wife, like someone not in medicine, they're like, well, yeah, of course. If you're constipated, you know, and it seems so obvious, but yet in actual practice, I can't, I can't explain to you how many kids come in with, um, 
bedwetting or poop accidents or pee accidents, and their and their pediatrician tells them, you know, they'll outgrow it or they're doing it on purpose or it's a behavioral problem. It's really a travesty, I, and I'm trying to fix that, but it's a lot of work. It's hard to get to rise above the noise. So when do parents take their children in? Is it when when it's consistent, like every night, you know, that they're wetting the bed? Um What's usually, what do you see? Yeah, here's a dilemma, and you, and you could get, like, you know, 10 other urologists on here, and they'd say 10 different things, but I, I think I've probably read about this more than anybody has, and I'm, I would debate anyone, you know, this finding. I think bedwetting, unfortunately, has gotten accepted as, like, a normal condition of childhood because it's so common. So, basically, physicians have told parents that it's okay to wet the bed until you're five, and then a certain number get better each year, which they're, they're right about that. But so that they basically end up saying, and it doesn't, you know, kill anyone. Um, so basically, if you wait long enough, most people stop wetting the bed. So what ends up happening is they say, you know, just wait. And then the kids are, five, you know, four, five, six. And then, you know, the years just tick by, you know. So it's seven, eight, nine. Next thing you know, they're, they're 12 or 13 and they come to my office and they've wasted 10 years, you know. Um, so, so that's the dilemma. The bedwetting can happen every night. It can happen rarely. But if it ever happens, it's honestly, it's abnormal. Um, and I can explain that in detail if you want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because when my um, nephew spends the night, he's what five, he just turned six. And I think he's grown out of it now. I mean, they say he's grown out of it. Um, uh, that's how they put it. But anytime he was at my house, we'd have to put a pull up on him. And he hated that, you know, because he was randomly um, wetting the bed. And they just, my brother and sister-in-law just figured it's just, you know, when if they you don't give him water, you know, before he goes to bed and, you know, maybe he's dreaming. Um, so I'm sure a lot of parents just kind of come up with their own reasons and answers for it. That's exactly right. Like um, the number of just kind of like, what seems like this is causing it, so that's what we'll call, you know, uh, that's what's causing it. Uh, so every every parent thinks their kid sleeps too deeply or, they, you know, they, they make too much urine at night. No one ever thinks they're not pooping adequately because that's not really visualized um, or it doesn't really manifest itself um, in anything they can see. And then, the, the you know, the consensus of how often or how much a kid should poop or even an adult should poop is really not not agreed upon. So I can tell you this, though, that in the urologic literature, newborn infants that are being monitored for, for wetting do not wet while they're asleep. They actually wake up, pee, and then go back to bed. So it's and, – and as far as I know, this is the one I, I hedge a little bit. I don't know of any other mammal that pees while sleeping. So that, that's what led to me to think this is a, this is a human-created problem, right? Hmm. So not only do no other mammals – not wet the bed, but no other mammal also purposely not doesn't poop, you know? Like, humans are the only animal that says, oh, I have to poop, I'm going to hold it in because I'm at school or it hurts and I'll go later. So no other no other mammal does that. So, Dr. Hunter, so do you get a lot of pushback from uh, from parents about having to get to give their, their kid an enema every night. And how long do you normally have to do this for to, to fix the bed? Is it a month like the, his son was, or is it, you know, elongated for a long period of time? Yeah. So it's funny. I mean, interesting, funny, not ha ha funny, but the, it's interesting that, you know, a lot of people don't want to give enemas and that's fine. We, we do different other therapies. It's just, um, it's just the um, most direct, approach to the problem, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I and I, I thought no one would do them. I mean, I, I didn't think it would be bought in at all. So, you know, about about uh, certain percentage of parents will say, no way, you know, my kid's not going to do that. But then other kids, you know, a, a, an equally large problem is some parents that just kind of run with it, you know, because I think you should do enemas, but you also have to monitor your progress because um, what we learned, and this is what we've kind of expanded on Dr. Regan's work a little bit, is that just because you have a dilated rectum full of poop and you give a month full of enemas, and, and to answer your question, Dr. Regan's therapy was designed for bedwetting, and he, he had a three-month course, which was a nightly for a month, every other night for a month, and then twice a week for a month. So he would – his thinking was you would empty them out in the first month and kind of taper them off. Mm -hmm. um, 
what we've learned is that not every kid gets better in a month. You know, and, and, and you could be doing enemas and, and not get any better if they're not getting the rectum empty. And so um, we, we do them four months at a time, but we check progress every four weeks, and we don't just do, we don't just do them willy-nilly if they're not getting better. Um, and so that's my, my biggest concern is not parents not wanting to do enemas. It's parents, like, just reading this and then just going doing enemas for, like, eight months and then not talking to us, you know, because mm-hmm. you need to have some guidance for it. Um, and and, and, yeah. the, and the key is, did you actually get the problem solved? It's not, it's not doing an enema that fixes anything, right? The, the fix, fixing the problem means emptying the rectum so that it shrinks back down to normal size. Is, it, would this have anything to do with um, a child's diet? And is there uh, foods you can eat or give your kid that would help alleviate this problem? Yeah, yes, everyone. You know, I would never say that diet doesn't matter. Obviously, because you need because the modern you know anyone that has kids knows it's hard to feed them a healthy diet, high in fiber, and, <laughs> right? And I think you know, and getting to eat. But my my view on this, the more I do this, and the more I've seen, is that this is primarily genetic and personality based. And what I mean by that is. I've seen kids that have parents that are so, so, you know, um, I guess this would be a pun, so anal about the kid's diet. And so the parents are so type A that the kids are eating, like, no gluten, no sugar. They're doing, like, whole foods. And these kids get backed up, right? So I think, I mean, obviously you should eat a, a healthy, well-balanced diet. But if the child is, is a anal attendant, for lack of a better word, or the type, or, or has the genetics that he's prone to constipation or prone to withholding if they are constipated, then no matter what you do, they're going to need help. And that's kind of our, our our hypothesis here is that the modern diet and the, and the modern human brain are such that I don't believe kids that are prone to this can poop without help because mm-hmm. we're just too smart for our own good. And there's, you know, like if it was 10,000 years ago when you were out, roaming a savanna, just eating nuts and berries, you probably would poop fine because it wouldn't ever hurt. But if you're in the real world where you're eating whatever you're eating and you're in diapers and, and, and you have a brain that says your poop hurts at all, you just squeeze your sink and the pain goes away, then most of those kids need something. And I think it used to be like castor oil or whatever, and now it's Miralax. But I, I think modern humans need help pooping it during childhood for sure, almost always. Yeah. How fascinating. It's just something that I would have never, never thought about. So, and it's such a big, I mean, every parent goes through it, you know. Oh my God. Yeah. And so, you know, what's the two most common problems seen for children in um, in the pediatrician's office? It's allergies and functional constipation, right? Yeah. And um, I think all of this is just kind of, you know, how we have... um, Heart disease and cancer is just kind of like a prehistoric human trying to fit in a modern world, you know. I think a lot mm-hmm. of these problems are the same thing. This is this interests me. Probably doesn't maybe, maybe doesn't interest you, but I, I was trying to figure out why everyone needs braces. You know, you ever thought about that? Yeah. Ch- why humans would evolve? Why, why humans would evolve crooked teeth? Yeah, I have not thought about that. What actually happens is if you live in a primitive society where they have like hard foods and diets early on, they actually don't ever need braces. It's modern society that promotes poor jaw growth and braces. And so I think all that ties together, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the way If we lived like prehistoric people, we wouldn't have constipation or need braces or, or have heart disease, you know, but, but it is what it is, and so we need help, and we have to make adaptations for, for modern society. Yeah, definitely. Wow, how fascinating. What, what advice would you give um, a med student thinking about specializing in urology? Oh, I think it's great. I mean, we have a huge demand. Um, there are so many, um, I get locums letters every day. Um, so we just, there's a need for urologists. Um, I think that uh, meet with the urologists in your medical school. I, I do feel for the ones that are in med school that don't have urology programs, but you can definitely find a urologist in your hometown, you know, and, and that's what a lot of people do. They'll go rotate through. And just much like um, if you think you're possibly interested in neurology, I would say do it because you're going to find something in neurology you like, just like I mentioned about medicine earlier. Um, urology, there's female urology, there's male urology, which is andrology, there's stone disease, there's minimally invasive urology. There's so many fields within neurology 
that if you think you're going to like it, I would say go for it because you're going to love it because you're going to find something that even more kind of fits your personality um, once you get into the field. Yeah. I heard um, that pediatric urologists, it's one of the um, most difficult specialties because you obviously you're working on infants and children, and so you have to be so precise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like um, I have super skill or anything, but I definitely the surgeries. That's the the one down. I think the one downside of all surgery is um, not being able to do them all perfectly, right? So th- mm-hmm. there are surgeries that I know I I'll do, and they'll be perfect. Like I have no stress at all going into them, and I know they're going to turn out fine. But certain uh, reconstructive surgeries, much like for plastic surgery or anything where it's a uh, small suture, small tissue. And especially if you're dealing with um, the urinary tract where you can have a leak or an obstruction, I, I get a significant amount of stress with regards to that because the the you can do like hypospadias is a classic example. We we we, um, we joke that hypospadias is a, is a harsh mistress because you can do several cases and do them exactly the same, and you know some will heal perfectly and some will fistulize, and you just can't really wrap your head around why you know the one failed. It's just a tough surgery. So we know that the more you do and the kind of more experience you get, the better you do. And, and, and you know, the sign of a surgery that has not been perfected yet that's constantly being modified, and, and that's the case for hypospadias. There's new innovations and new procedures, always techniques always being introduced, and that's because, you know, they're not perfect yet. And once we get that down, you know, that, that innovation will stop. But for now, and we're always looking for a way to make it uh, the perfect repair, and that's still kind of elusive. Yeah. Talking about innovation, how has medicine changed since you started practicing? Oh, yeah, it's so interesting, you know, because um, I'll cover adult call um, for the residents and the, for the hospital. And so much, you know, I, not, I, I guess I'm getting older, but I've only been out. I finished in 2003, and I did fellowship till 2006. So I, I was done training for adult urology in 2003, which I guess is getting on, but a lot of the surgery that we did when I was training, we don't do anymore. So we don't do open prostates, prostatectomies anymore. You know, they're all done robotically. So a lot of the surgeries that I can do or I could do theoretically open, many of my residents have never done open because they're all done robotically. And that that's good in some respects and, and, and bad in some respects. The technology has improved uh, for, for stone removal and stone. Uh, I remember we used to laser these stones and we have to break them up into tiny pieces and we have to go get the pieces out and we used to think you know i wish there was a way to just break them and suck the pieces out as you're breaking lo and behold you know like after i finished they, they came up with that and then um we used to do uh transurethral prostate resections for for bph and um we'd have to do it a certain number of length of time with a certain fluid because it only had unipolar cautery and you couldn't do it with um, saline and and now they've they've advanced the bipolar and you can do all that in saline so a lot of technological, um, scientifically, you know, equipment-based innovations. Um, and then there's been a lot of innovations in treatment of disease, too. For for prostates, there was no kind of MRI of the prostate before. Now that's guiding a lot of biopsy. Um, we used to treat, you know, all prostate surgery cancer with surgery. Now we observe a lot more. So it's just, yeah, it's it's interesting to see. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep track of um, or keep on top of every field. Um, but I definitely notice... Um, I'm kind of falling behind in my adult test skills for sure. Um, I have an interesting uh, question. This is more just for me. Um, um, my niece is a year and a half years old. Um, what What's your best advice for somebody to, when do you start potty training somebody? And is there, what you, can you start potty training somebody in a specific way to hopefully avoid the, uh, the bedwetting? Or is there any correlation between the two of those? So here's my, <laughs> excuse me, my understanding on this and, Obviously, I think I'm right, but you know, there's a lot again. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of people that promote uh, elimination communication. You know, they want to train little infants and they want to avoid diapers. I, I, I would put it this way, which I think is a good way to understand it. Like, what other kind of responsibility, meaning a decision with an action, would you give? You know, an infant, and the, and the answer is zero. Right? You wouldn't have an infant choose anything because they have no idea what they're doing. They're just babies, and so to give them complete control over when they go to the bathroom, I think, is, is a problem. Now, you can't keep them in diapers forever, but I, I noticed with my own three kids, and this is borne out in my, my practice, that you can't really teach a child 
to go to the bathroom in a timely fashion much more before three. So sure, you can teach them to hold their pee and poop in so they we don't wet, but you'll never know if they're holding it in too much, right? You'll, so it'll be just kind of luck of the draws whether you get a kid that is a withholder and has the genes that leads to accidents. And you won't know that until it's way too late, years later when they have accidents. So we've proven that early training is actually bad because it leads to withholding and then leads to accidents. So my theory is don't start before three, because you got to be able to talk to them too. Be like, you know, did you go? Do you have to go? Um, you have to be able to communicate somewhat. They have to be able to tell you they have to go. They have to be able to kind of get themselves to the bathroom, kind of leave up in their pants. So there has to be some kind of cooperation. Other you're just otherwise you're just kind of training yourself to kind of put them on the potty. So for, from from my experience, starting at three, um, and then if they're not trained by four, then you have an issue. Um, and then before the ages of three, just really focus on them, you know, pooping regularly, and don't let them get constipated. Don't let them go, you know, days without pooping. Um, because that'll set up for failure. Um, and of course, if they demand, you know, like some parents say, you know, we're not forcing them, but they just want to go. And I'm like, cool with that. I just don't want them um, to lose track of what's going on and, and, and make sure the kid understands that they want to put, do it in a pull-up. It's fine. Yeah. Because the problems arise from withholding, not from actually potty training. Does that make sense? It's, it's, that, they, it's that you give them the choice and the cho- they choose not to go. And I'll give you one other anecdote to why Potty training is, is bad for not, you know, not, not like it's a value judgment, but why it's, it's negatively influences health. So little girls come to my office with UTIs, you know, like simple UTIs, cystitis, bladder infections all the time. Do you know when they show up? Like without fail? Right what? after potty training. Right after potty okay. training. Okay. Yeah. So what does that tell you? Like they were emptying fine, no infections. All of a sudden they potty trained and now they're holding in too long. And you know they're holding in too long because E. coli is growing in the bladder, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, that that really hit me as a as a good good evidence for for kind of delaying things a bit. Um, one more question involving this potty training thing: Do you see is there a difference um, with people swear by that? I haven't really noticed it. It's just girls are more prone to infection, so I think that's uh, that's something you have to consider. Um, but in general, I, you know. I, I think it depends on the genetics in terms of like um, whether or not. Yeah, I like, and what, I'll clarify that by saying you know I have three kids, right? Two of them got constipated, the other didn't. They ate the same diet, right? So something in their genes led to that, and then and, and ties into that personality whether or not you're you're a withholder or not. You're the kind of kid that will poop if it, they need to or will hold it in, and also whether or not holding in poop manifests itself in any way. You know, there's a lot of kids out there. They're full of poop that have zero symptoms, and that's just how they're wired, and it's good for them. And mm-hmm. it's probably not a medical problem if they're feeling okay, but they may have, you know, belly pain from the poop, but it doesn't really cause any issues. Um, so yeah. that's kind of what, why, why it varies a lot. Yeah. Well, we need people like you to study this stuff because I think our society is so used to just thinking, well, it's just their age, you know, it's – it's just common. He's just growing, you know, and there's actually reasons behind it. So. Oh, yeah. And I, I, if I was going to be like a take-home message for this, is number one, accidents are not a child's fault, right? There, it, incontinence is a large cause of child abuse, and, you know, that should be like a never thing, and no one ever talks about it. I don't, I don't know why I tried to kind of present about that, but it seems to get ignored. But that's a big deal, and so people need to be – you know, understand if your child's having accidents, it's not something that they can be punished out of. Um, mm-hmm. because that's a travesty. And the other is that if a child's having accidents, whether it's due to the constipation or not, it's a medical problem, right? So it's never normal to be peeing or pooping on yourself. And if you said, you know, to outgrow it and ignore Hodges's, you know, poop theory, that's fine. But what if it's something more significant, right? They may be having accidents because, you know, Sure, 95% of the kids are just constipated, but 5% have, you know, either an anatomic or a neurologic disorder that needs a workup. So even mm-hmm. if you were just trying to find those 5%, that's why I think all these kids with accidents, parents should get their kids to a doctor or to a urologist and get them worked up because it's never normal and it can be fixed. Yeah. Well, tell us about, um, we're just getting ready to wrap this up, but I know you have uh, a few books out. Tell us about those books. Oh, yeah. So the very first book we wrote was in 2012. It's called It's No Accident, which was our kind of when we first got into this. Tells a story basically that I, um, I went over earlier 
about how we made this discovery and how we found Dr. Regan and, and started treating this problem. And then you know, that was published by a publisher, and we've never been able to get the rights back because uh, it, it's kind of outdated now. We've changed our therapies uh, quite a bit, or not changed them, but we've updated them. And so um, we were never able to re do a new edition of that book, which is unfortunate. Um, but it's still out there. It's a good book. There's one in Korea, too, if you want a Korean version, which is a whole other funny story I could talk about. But um, mm -hmm. then we did uh, several other books. We've done a book called Bedwetting and Accents Aren't Your Fault, because that we, we're trying to get kids to understand that these accents are not on purpose, that there's a reason behind them. And then we've done um, a MOP book or the MOP anthology, anthology edition. Uh, the MOP book is basically Dr. Regan's Protocol that we modified, it's the modified Oregon protocol that we adapted for kids with not just bed wetting, but daytime wetting and poop accents, and we've kind of been more aggressive. And so that's our kind of our, our most up-to-date um, treatment options. We've got a couple of yeah. other um, just, like, fun books about the topic, like Jane and the Giant Poop. We've got, like, a workbook for kids to learn <laughs> about it. <laughs> and the most yeah. recent we've done, the pre-MOP plan, and the, and the pre-MOP book, came out because we're getting so many questions about just functional constipation, kids that are having constipation issues early in life that haven't yeah. quite trained yet. And so that's that plan, to kind of get kids set up so they don't develop these issues. In the future. Yeah. And I'll link these books in the description of, of your podcast so our listeners can check them out. Um, and to wrap this up, this is a question we like to ask physicians because our main listeners are um, obviously other physicians and then um, – med students. So what advice would you give um, to someone who is done with school, done with their fellowship, and they're about to enter the physician career world? Yeah, I think the um, main thing is to, and I learned this from like a, from Pena, there's a lot of um, things that aren't really um, solved yet you know what i mean like like modern medicine we think of it as modern medicine but it's not really optimized so dr Pena told the story of when he was describing his surgery which is a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty he was looking for a muscle that someone described that like wasn't there you know he was like kind of like the emperor's new clothes kind of thing where if you have someone that's prominent in the field it's not they're not infallible so if you're if you're doing something and like i did and you're not getting good results, don't question, I mean, you should question yourself, make sure you're doing it right. But it may be that the therapy is wrong, right? So it may be that all the teaching is incorrect. So definitely question the status quo if you're not seeing the results that are published because maybe no one's seeing the results and maybe this is a, you know, mass <laughs> hysteria and there's a better way to do things. That's what I would definitely look at. Yeah, that's awesome. Kind of be your own advocate, you know, just keep on researching i think research is is so important it's so important look into it exactly yeah. look into it and see why yeah. because it may be that you're doing it wrong but it may be that there was constipation that people were missing right and which is possible yeah it happened before well what else do you have uh, anything else on the horizon any more books we're trying to adjust the program so that we can get better better feedback so our biggest failing is that you know if people don't see me at wake or even if they see me at Wake, I don't have a, a inpatient or kind of – I don't have like a bowel boot camp. Like what they do in the major bowel boot camps, which are in some centers, is you'll go in and you'll get cleaned out, and they'll watch you do it. So you're there for a week, they get you on enemas, and they kind of observe every day with an x-ray to see how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. So our next goal is to create a boot camp that allows patients remotely to get their enema protocol fine-tuned so that they know it's actually working. Because I've had an, uh, some people do a certain enema that maybe it wasn't effective and they won't find out until a month in when we mm -hmm. do the x-rays. And so I'm trying to get that fixed. So that's our next goal for this year to kind of get this mop boot camp we're calling it off the ground. And it will probably be part at wake, part kind of remotely for a patient not in this state. Um, and we'll see if we can get that going forward. Yeah. Well, so awesome. All the stuff that you're doing is, is super inspiring. And, uh, I mean, you're, you're not just a pediatric urologist. I mean, you're with what you're doing, you're a researcher, um, and you're an associate professor as well, right? Yeah, I gotta get, I gotta go for promotion soon. I gotta get working on that. So you've, you've got a lot going on, but, um, so I think, thank you so much for giving us 
you know, some of your time today. We really appreciate it. No, I appreciate the interest. And, uh, yeah, anybody that has questions about it, they can contact me, especially, you know, for your niece or whatever. They bring the issues of having email. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, so. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, go to www.pacificcompanies.com.